Hello. So in this video, I'm going to give you a brief overview into the autonomic nervous system, specifically sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions, the neurotransmitters that are involved, and where the neurotransmitter receptors that will receive these neurotransmitters are located, and then some examples of effects the parasympathetic nervous system will have on different organs versus sympathetic. So let's start with what I have here on the screen. On the far right side, we have the examples of organs. We've got blood vessels on top, followed by sweat glands, the heart in red, bronchioles in blue, stomach in yellow, kidneys in gray, and then the eyeball on the lower right. Sympathetic pathways are indicated in green, of which you have three different types, which I will get into in just a bit. And then you have purple, which is parasympathetic on the very bottom. So let's start with some of the organization of these different systems. Now in the sympathetic in green and parasympathetic in purple, you will see that you will have technically a two chain system in which you have two motor neurons. The first is called a preganglionic neuron. And that goes for each of these first neurons, be it any of the three sympathetic in green or the purple parasympathetic. Then you have the postganglionic neuron. And this implies the neuron that comes after the ganglion. Now, what is a ganglion? Now, a ganglion is a swelling in the peripheral nervous system that will have cell bodies. So in this case, we will have a ganglion where the postganglionic neuron and preganglionic neuron meet for sympathetic, and we will have it for parasympathetic as well. Now you may see this unusual one up on the top for sympathetic. And this is a modified ganglion. In fact, it's got a special name, and the name is adrenal medulla, which is part of the adrenal glands. Now here, instead of having a postganglionic neuron, we have chromaffin cells. These chromaffin cells are really nothing more than modified postganglionic neurons. They're postganglionic neurons that lost their axons. And instead of releasing neurotransmitters, they will release hormones. But more on that in just a bit. So let's now get into the neurotransmitters that are released and where. So we'll start with where the parasympathetic division in purple and where acetylcholine is released which is the main neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic division. The preganglionic neuron will release acetylcholine at the parasympathetic autonomic ganglion. So here, we have ACH released. ACH, acetylcholine, will bind to cholinergic receptors on the dendrites of the postganglionic neuron. Here, these neurotransmitter receptors that are cholinergic are termed nicotinic, named after the fact that nicotine can also bind to these receptors and exert similar effects. When acetylcholine binds to these receptors, it excites this postganglionic parasympathetic neuron, and you will get an action potential going down that postganglionic neuron, ultimately to cause the release of, yep, more acetylcholine at the target organs. So here we have acetylcholine again. But here on the target organs, it's a different type of cholinergic receptor. On the target organs, doesn't matter if it's the eyeballs, kidneys, stomach, bronchioles, or heart, here 
these receptors are cholinergic muscarinic receptors that will receive acetylcholine and then cause a parasympathetic response in these target organs. So when acetylcholine binds to muscarinic receptors on the heart, it's going to decrease heart rate and cardiac output. When it binds to the muscarinic receptors in the bronchioles, it's going to decrease the diameter of these bronchioles, thereby leading to less air going in and less air going out. Now remember that the parasympathetic division is the rest and digest division. So these decreases should make sense. Now being the rest and digest division, acetylcholine and parasympathetic activation will increase stomach activity and the activity of many other digestive organs. It will ramp up kidney activity. If you digest and absorb more nutrients, you need to eliminate more waste products. And it will constrict the pupils of the eyeball, decrease the diameter. Now these effects should make sense, again, because parasympathetic is rest and digest. So here, for parasympathetic, pretty straightforward. It's acetylcholine released by the preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron. What changes is what type of cholinergic receptor does acetylcholine bind to. All right. So let's now switch gears and go to the sympathetic division shown in green. The preganglionic neurons will also here release acetylcholine. Does not matter what format, so to speak, this sympathetic division takes. It's acetylcholine. And acetylcholine will bind onto these sympathetic postganglionic neurons, be it a neuron or be it chromaffin cells. And here, these are nicotinic, just like what you see with parasympathetic division. So that does not change. So this is kind of helpful because you can think of all these ganglion being always, always, always acetylcholine released by the preganglionic neuron and always, always, always binding to cholinergic nicotinic receptors. So now let's go through each of these three sympathetic pathways. We'll skip the first one for now and we'll talk about the, the sweat glands. Now, when acetylcholine binds to nicotinic receptors on postganglionic neurons leading to sweat glands, it's going to trigger an action potential. And the action potential goes all the way down. And this is the one exception for the sympath sympathetic division. You will get acetylcholine released. Acetylcholine will then bind... muscarinic receptors on sweat glands and you will get sweating. So that's the one sort of outlier of the sympathetic division that acetylcholine is released by the postganglionic neuron to bind to muscarinic receptors and then you will get a sympathetic response in this case sweating. Besides that, all the other sympathetic postganglionic neurons, when excited with an action potential, will release not acetylcholine, but norepinephrine. This will be the case for this lower pathway. And also, the same thing happens with the chromaffin cells at the adrenal medulla. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are released. Now, the norepinephrine and epinephrine released by the adrenal medulla actually enters into the bloodstream. And you get a hormonal response as a result. 
This is one reason why the sympathetic division has a longer lasting, more widespread response because you have a hormonal response in addition to the neural response. Now let's go back to the majority of the sympathetic nervous system and how you will have norepinephrine released by the postganglionic neuron. Norepinephrine will then bind on the target tissues, be it the heart, the bronchioles, the stomach, the kidneys, or the eyeball. And here, these receptors are called adrenergic. And they're, called, and they're called adrenergic because norepinephrine is also called noradrenaline. And when norepinephrine binds to the heart and, it, and its adrenergic receptors, heart rate goes up, stroke volume will go up, and therefore cardiac output goes up. When it binds to the bronchioles, the airways will get wider. Remember that the sympathetic division is called the fight-or-flight response. Therefore, you want more oxygen going in, more CO2 going out. You want more blood to be moving these gases throughout the body. Therefore, the importance of increased heart activity, increased airway diameter. When it goes to the stomach, it actually turns down digestion in the stomach and the multiple other gastrointestinal organs. It will inhibit kidney function, so therefore you get less urination. And it will increase the diameter of the pupils. The norepinephrine and epinephrine released into the blood vessels by the adrenal medulla will amplify this and prolong the response. So what you see here, in summary is that the preganglionic neurons always release acetylcholine. And that acetylcholine will always bind to cholinergic nicotinic receptors. Does not matter if it's sympathetic or parasympathetic divisions. From there, you will see the majority of the organs in your body are dually innervated by parasympathetic and sympathetic. Dual innervation implies that the majority of internal organs are receiving neural signals from the parasympathetic division, one, and the sympathetic division, two. And then as we went through, you could see parasympathetic and sympathetic having contrasting effects on these organs. And that is dynamic antagonism. Dynamic antagonism being how the sympathetic and parasympathetic will fluctuate in which one is dominant throughout the day to monitor and regulate homeostasis. So in conclusion, what you should be able to do is outline where different neurotransmitters are released, what receptors are where, and then what are the effects of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions on various internal organs.